stuff going on in our lives and all the activities. Can you imagine the week it was for Jesus? From triumphant entry into Jerusalem, the events we talked about Wednesday nights as far as they went on in Jerusalem on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, yes, and even Saturday, preparing for this day, for Easter, for the fact that we serve a risen Savior. Amen. One of the events was Thursday night when Jesus sat down with his disciples for their last meal together. As he did, he instituted what we've come to know as the Lord's Supper, our communion. This morning, as we kind of begin our service, we want to begin with communion. We want to begin by remembering Christ's broken body, his shed blood, broken and shed for us. We want to remember the cross. Oh, we're not going to stay at the cross. We're going to go to the tomb and we're going to celebrate the truth that Christ is risen. Yes, Christ is risen indeed. But let's not forget the trip there. Let's not forget what Jesus did for us. So I ask you to take the sacraments that I hope you already have, the cup and the, the bread. I remind you the Lord himself ordained this holy sacrament. He commanded his disciples to partake of the bread and wine, emblems of his broken body and shed blood. I remind you that it is his table. Let us remember that it is the memorial of the death and passion of our Lord. Also a token of his coming again. Let us not forget that we are one at one table with the Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who out of your tender mercy and grace gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. We ask that you would hear us as we humbly come before you this morning. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would bless these elements, the bread, the cup, and that as we receive them, we might remember what Christ did for us, what led up to Resurrection Sunday, his death, his broken body, his shed blood for us. Speak to us this morning. Touch our hearts. Lord, as we celebrate, might we not forget, in Jesus' name we pray. We're reminded in the scriptures but the same night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body given for you to do this in remembrance of me. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, the cup also. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we come before you now in true humility and faith as we partake of this holy sacrament through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I ask you now to take the bread, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, preserve you blameless into everlasting life. I ask you to take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Then I ask you to take the cup, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you blameless into everlasting life. I ask you to take and drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Take and drink, please. Lord, be with us during the rest of this service and in everything. Might you be praised and 
you be glorified. We thank you for the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. But we thank you that this morning we don't celebrate just the fact that Christ died for us. We celebrate the truth that Christ is risen. Yes, Christ is risen. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
hope you know him as Lord of your life. You have hopefully a bulletin in front of you, and there you see the prayer request. Ask that you remember the many needs of our church family. Let's be in prayer this morning for our country. Let's be in prayer for our leaders. Let's be in prayer for brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Those who are gathering and celebrating Easter today, that they do so realizing that it may cost them their lives. And yet they still gather to worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Would you stand with me, please, as we go to prayer? This morning, dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the truth that Christ is risen. Yes, Christ is risen indeed. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, because we know that we serve a living Savior who is with us today. And every day, moment by moment, as we walk through this world, this morning we praise your name. We thank you that we can gather with brothers and sisters in Christ and worship you and give you glory. We thank you for family and friends that can be here with us. And just ask in Jesus' name that this Easter Sunday, Lord, create in us fresh and anew. The truth of what it means to follow you. Speak to our hearts today. Be with the many needs, dear Lord, that we have. You know those that are struggling physically who need a touch from you. We pray that you would be with those individuals. We pray that you would keep your hand upon them. You need to be with Tom Chance. Help him, touch him. Be with Gaylene's brother, Tom. Be, dear Heavenly Father, with Jackie's sister. Touch her. Be with Randy's mother, America, Lord. Do you know what she needs? Lord, so many needs. You know each one of them. Be with those that are looking at surgery in the near future and keep your hand upon them. It's so great to see Chris here this morning. We pray that you would touch his body, strengthen him, Lord, and just keep your hand on him today. We pray that you would go and be with Karen's granddaughter. Be with Miranda today and that new little boy. We thank you for the newness of life. We thank you for the reminder of beginnings. Oh, Lord. And they gathered at the tomb that first Easter Sunday morning. All things were different. Everything had changed. And Lord, might we know that change takes place. When we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and when we follow Him day by day, moment by moment, touch us today. Be with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Lord, wherever people gather this day to worship and to praise Jesus, might your presence be there as we ask you to come and be with us. <clears throat> might they know your Holy Spirit working in their midst. Might you speak through your word. Might hearts be uplifted and people be encouraged. <clears throat> it's been a difficult year, Lord. It was right around this time last year where we were having to close our doors and not gather like we normally do. But we're here today and we thank you for that and we praise your name. Thank you for allowing the church to gather. Bless us this morning. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. We ask it all. Amen. As you're seated, let's sing together. Oh, how he loves you and me.
for his love. His love that took into account. You understand, no one forced Jesus to the cross. It wasn't that they caught him and took him. He went willingly for you and for me. Because he loved us so much. As we've mentioned a little bit, that last week, that time with his disciples, that time in the garden, And then on trial, beaten, put on the cross, and put into the tomb. I love a little snippet I read this week that said one of Joseph of Arimathea's friends asked him, Why in the world did you let him use your tomb? said, I mean, that was a costly tomb, hand hewn, you know, made just for you and your family. And Joseph replied, he only needed it for the weekend. <laughs> we serve a risen Savior. And I direct your attention to Mark's Gospel this morning, the 16th chapter. As we've talked about, as we've used Mark several times through Lent and leading up to this Easter Sunday morning. Mark is a book of action, so he doesn't take a lot of time explaining things. He just, bang, here it is. So in chapter 15, he ends with the burial of Jesus. 47th verse says, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And then we get to the first verse of chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. If you go to the Greek, I don't know that alarm is strong enough. They were terrified. Uh, they were scared out of their wits, we would say, today. I mean, think about it. Going to a tomb, you were expecting to find a corpse. Struggling along the way, how are we going to roll back the stone? And then they get there. And Luke and Matthew tell us it was an angel. The account says that when he came down, there was an earthquake. As I said, Mark is just simple. He just kind of gets to it. He's just there, sitting on the right side, and they're alone. Verse 6, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, 
because they were afraid. <coughs> I think it's interesting and important that we know in our culture the first ones to know that Jesus Christ had arisen were women. You notice that? It, 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 it's kind of interesting, you know, when you when you think about it, it was the baby in Elizabeth's womb that first jumped when Mary was carrying baby Jesus. You know, and it was Elizabeth who then gives us this wonderful poem, this wonderful description of what's happening in Mary's life. And, and now we come to the other end. <laughs> of Jesus' time here on earth. The guys have all scattered. Let's admit it, they're hiding, probably fearful for their lives. I wouldn't blame them. They killed Jesus, are we next on the list? Look at the women. They go to the tomb. <clears throat> It's interesting to know what they do. To note, if you will, their deeds. They gather spices. Now, supposedly, those who buried Jesus, Joseph, that they would have put spices on the cloths as they wrapped his body. That was tradition. But the women weren't sure that the guys did a good enough job. And the men who had taken Jesus' body and put him in the tomb, they were actually part of the Sanhedrin who had said Jesus was to die. And so I wonder if they kind of went to the tomb and said, you know what, we've got to make sure this is done right. We love him. We care about him. If you will, it's a ministry of love. As they go to the tomb to make sure the body is properly taken care of. See not only their deeds, see their devotion. <laughs> they went very early in the morning, and many of us down through the years have struggled with that with sunrise services, haven't we? Yeah. That they went early in the morning. In fact, some scripture says they got there before it was even sunlight out. But they had a task to do, a deed that they thought was important. And they were devoted to Jesus Christ while he walked this earth. And so they wanted to show that devotion. And so they went to the tomb early in the morning to complete that task correctly to make sure that things were done right. Now on the way they had some discussion. As the scripture says, the discussion is, who's going to roll away the stone? Let's admit it, what were they expecting to find at the tomb? They were expecting to find a corpse. They were expecting to find a dead body that needed proper preparation in Jewish tradition because they did not embalm like the Egyptians did, and so the body would stink and so what they were going to do was to take those spices and make sure that Jesus had a proper burial. But it was going to take care of the stone. Who was going to roll it away? Can you imagine their shock, their surprise, when it's already rolled away? And isn't it just like our Lord and Savior to roll away stones, to roll away obstacles in our lives that keep us from Him? Yeah. You know the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out, don't you? You know that wasn't necessary. It was rolled away so the women could get in. So that they could 
could see what had happened. As they came with their ministry of love, with the devotion, with the desire to fulfill what they thought was appropriate at that time. They go into the tomb. And there they find Mark again, very plainly and calmly, just says, a young man dressed in a white robe. Read some of the other accounts in Matthew and Luke. I still remember a laundry detergent that talked about getting your clothes whiter than white. And I think they kind of got the idea from Scripture. <laughs> When, when, when it talks about the angel there in, in garments of white, you know, bright as can be, brighter than bright. But he's there. And notice what he does while he's there. He basically gives them peace. He gives them a person he reminds them of power and of proof. Let me go through those. The first is peace. Be not alarmed. And it's interesting to me the theme that I think Jesus picks up from this point on. For it's almost every time when he meets someone, it's don't be afraid. Peace. When he stands in the midst of the disciples this evening, it's peace to you. And in the midst of their turmoil, in the midst of their struggles, of not knowing what they were going to do, of not knowing what exactly was going on, how was God working? The angel says, don't be alarmed. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know the struggles in your life. I don't know battles. Oh, I know some of them, but I know I don't know them all. Can I tell you I'm thankful that I can stand before you and say that God still comes into our midst and says, peace. He says, don't be alone. I haven't forgotten you. I know what's going on. And even though you may not understand it, and you might even not even know all the ways I'm working, God says, I'm still working in your midst. And the women that morning, they did not understand what was happening. But yet here is the angel sitting at the right side who says, don't be alarmed, peace. And then what does he do? He presents to them a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. The same person that we can present to the world today. The same person we better present to the world today. Because the world doesn't need all other fangled ideas or all other people. The world needs, first of all, Jesus Christ. Amen. As much today as ever. And just as that angel said to the ladies, you seek Jesus. We need to make sure that we seek Jesus. That we get as close to him as possible. That we allow him to be our Lord, as we've sung about this morning, to be our Savior. Allow his presence to guide us and direct us day by day, moment by moment. Peace, don't be alarmed. Let me tell you about a person. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. He shows God's power when he says he's not here. He's risen. Victory over death and the grave. When the Romans had put Jesus into the tomb, they thought it was over. Oh, even though the Sanhedrin was a little afraid, Ananias was a little afraid.
let's seal the tube. Let's make sure we get some guards around it. God was saying, you guys do what you want. I'm the one in control. And there's going to come a day when my son is no longer in the tomb, but his back sitting at the right side of me, interceding for all of us. Praise his name. <laughs> and the angel was just saying, he is risen, he is not here. He's saying, God's in control no matter what the situation. Power. Not the power of armies, not the power of, power of governments, not the power of riches. The power of the creator of heaven and earth. Who spoke and it came into being. Who walked on the water. Restored sight to the blind. Who gave hearing to those who were deaf. Gave the ability to speak to those who could not speak. That type of power. And he says, you want us proof? You want to know it's so? He says, look where they laid him. See the place where they laid him. I like, again, some of the other accounts of Matthew, Luke, and John, where it talks about the, basically, the funeral cloths, the clothing, laying there in the tomb. I imagine it was just laid, in, in, in my vision of it again, it's just laid out as if one moment a body was there and the next moment it's gone. And the clothes just kind of but it also talked about the scarf on the head that was folded and put off to the side. All it was saying was, look, he had been here, but he ain't here no more. We serve a risen Savior. And the proof was, he was gone. Oh, I know they try to say the disciples stole the body. Can you imagine these 12 guys that are so afraid <coughs> that they ran away when the soldiers came up to the garden? That one of his followers, probably not one of the 12, tradition tells us it was Mark, ran away and just left his clothes, remember? because he was so afraid. All of a sudden, they become so bold and so brave that they can go and take on the guards and move the stone and take it by his body. No, it didn't happen that way. What happened was God said to his son, it's time. And so there it was. The ministry of love of the women, followed by a message of life by the angel, concluded with a mission, if you will, of liberation. A mission that says, go tell. It was a command. Go and tell his disciples and Peter. You know, Peter, the one who had really blown it, the one who had denied Jesus three times. Make sure that he understands, that he knows that Jesus is alive. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that they pick out Jesus to remind. Because it reminds me no matter what I've done, no matter how far I've gone away from God, he still wants me to know he loves me. He still wants me to know he cares about me. He still wants me to know that he wants to work in my life. And so they are demanded to tell. And they go. But do you get the change that has taken place? They came to the tomb. 
expecting to find a corpse, expecting to finish the preparation of a burial. They came to the tomb with heads down, discussing all the difficulties going on. And now they're leaving with a message they still don't fully understand, but they know it is so awesome, it is so amazing, that it's going to change their lives forever. And so verse 8 says, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. It said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I have to say something that would get me in trouble because it would be chauvinistic. Something about not being able to keep your mouth closed. <laughs> but uh, somewhere along the line, they can't keep their mouths closed. Because they did share with the others <clears throat> the fact that the tomb was empty. And we know the disciples went and they looked. We know that two on the Emmaus Road, Jesus came and met with them and talked to them as they walked along. We know they were all gathered. One of my favorite things to preach about is what happens at 7.30 on Sunday evening on that first Easter. And it's a reminder that everybody was gathered together. But they were gathered together out of fear. And what happens? Jesus stands in their midst and says, peace. Says, it's me and I'm alive. <clears throat> we gather today as Christians because Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. Because the tomb was empty. One has said, if Christ is still in the grave, nothing really matters. But if he came out of the grave, then nothing but bad matters. You see, if we really believe that something important has happened, that we're celebrating this awesome truth, that God the Son lived and walked among us for 30 some odd years, that he died, he was put on the cross, put in the grave, and then rose. If we really believe that, then we should come each Sunday into church believing something important is going on. It should remind us every Sunday that we gather together, not just for the ordinary, but because God has worked in our lives and in our midst in an extraordinary way. Each Sunday should be a mini Easter, a, a, a mini celebration again of the fact that Christ is risen. Yes, Christ is risen indeed. If something really important is going on, then I believe every day we should realize that we have access to God the Father through Jesus Christ, His Son. Because Jesus' grave is empty. And He's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Interceding on our behalf. If we really believe all this, it should remind us that Jesus is still in the business today of changing lives. And no matter how broken our families, no matter how much pain there is in our hearts because of the way others have treated us, no matter what else is going on in this world, we should know that Jesus Christ can and does make a difference today, Amen. still, now, Amen. here. Amen. Why? 
Because Christ is risen. Yes, Christ is risen. Indeed. Do you really believe what we gather for? Do you really believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave and intercedes on your and my behalf? Do you really believe that you don't have to take one step by yourself? He's promised to be with us. He's promised the presence of His Holy Spirit. He's promised to guide and direct us in all truth. And we can trust in Him for today tomorrow, and whatever the future holds until that day, we see him face to face. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. That first Sunday morning, that first Easter Sunday morning, they're still learning all of that. Over the next several days and actually a few weeks until Jesus' ascension, He'll pop in and pop out among them. I think he's trying to teach them some things. We'll talk about that in the weeks ahead. But one of the things he's trying to teach them is he's with them always. And he knows what's going on. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what's going on in mine. Yes. And he loves us. And he's working in our midst. Praise his holy name. Christ is risen, yes, Christ is risen indeed. Let's make sure we celebrate it, not just today, but every day. Would you stand with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your plan of salvation. We thank you that Jesus came as a babe in a manger, and we thank you that he walked this earth. Yes, we even thank you that he went to the cross for us and the tomb. But we thank you and we praise your name, for we know today we serve a risen Savior who is walking amongst us. And for your Holy Spirit who is present, guiding and directing us day by day, moment by moment. Lord, help us not forget that. Help us to celebrate Easter, but not just on Easter. Help us to take it as the fact that it is, that it has changed things so that it makes a difference in our lives every day. Thank you for all that you've done for us, for all that you're doing, and for that, Lord, which we don't even see that you're going to do. We 